Welcome back to our second video for chapter 14. Here we're going to look at DNA packaging as well as the steps for DNA replication. So we've kind of seen this before when we first examined eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. But remember, eukaryotes have a nucleus, and that's where we would find our most of our DNA, although there is also DNA found in our mitochondria. And in prokaryotes, in contrast, they do not have a nucleus. So their DNA is found in an area within the cytoplasm known as the nucleoid, nucleoid. If we look at the size of a typical prokaryotic versus eukaryotic genome, E. coli have 4.6 million base pairs. What is a base pair? So I cut and paste a previous picture over here on the right. If I have my rungs of the ladder here, each rung of the ladder is one base pair. For example, here I have A and I have T over here. This is one base pair. This G and C is a second base pair. So E. coli has 4.6 million base pairs in its chromosome, in its DNA. Humans, we have 6 billion base pairs, and this is in our diploid cells. This would be in like our body or somatic cells. In our sperm and egg, we would have 3 billion because these are haploid. So that is quite big. In fact, if you look at the DNA in E. coli, it's so big that it would be about 1.1 millimeter, one millimeter, if we actually cut and stretched out the DNA in E. coli. So how do we even fit it into this tiny cell, which is about one micrometer in diameter? How prokaryotic cells compact their DNA is by supercoiling, supercoiling their DNA. For eukaryotes, we have to do something better. So we're going to see that in the next few slides. Before I move on, though, I wanted to address a question or a few questions that our book poses. It asks us about differences in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells in terms of compartmentalization. Since eukaryotes have a nucleus, taking DNA and making intermediate molecules like RNA happens in the nucleus, but then the process of making proteins happens in the cytoplasm. But when I look at prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, so everything is happening in the cytoplasm, the making of RNA and the protein synthesis. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? If I look at compartmentalization in eukaryotes, having the nucleus allows me to divide the steps or divide these processes. DNA is used to make RNA and then RNA is used to make proteins. This allows greater complexity. So we have more complex and types of RNA and proteins, but it's slower, it's slower. You have to move things around. In prokaryotes, it's we're gonna see that the RNA molecules and proteins are less complex, but the advantage is that it's much faster. Additionally, instead of the supercoiling that we see in prokaryotic cells, DNA, and we've seen some of this in our previous chapters as well, DNA we know is wrapped around histone proteins to form those beads on a string called nucleosomes. So I see several nucleosomes here. Nucleosomes are also coiled more and more, further condensing to form chromatin. And I can see that coiling process here. And they use scaffolding proteins to do so. Eventually, we mentioned before in the mitosis and meiosis chapters that we see chromosomes when we're getting ready to divide the cell. And what's not mentioned, or what we haven't mentioned yet, but we saw that in the article that we've been reading, our terms shown here. So really condensed DNA is known as heterochromatin. This is tightly packed DNA, so DNA that's tightly wrapped around those histoproteins, histone proteins. These genes are not being expressed, right? You're not making RNA and protein from these genes. But euchromatin is loosely packed DNA. So DNA is loosely wrapped around those histone proteins these genes are being expressed. What that means is DNA is being read 
and transcribed into RNA, and that'll eventually be used to make proteins. So now that we know more about how DNA is compacted and the structure of DNA, let's look at how DNA replication occurs. Remember that when we were talking about mitosis, we learned about interphase and we had gap one, the S phase, gap two. During S phase, we know that we generate identical sister chromatids. So how does that DNA replication occur? When we were first looking at how DNA replication might occur, there were three suggested models, three uh, hypotheses, you could say. The first one was conservative replication. And looking at down here, I mentioned that the gray, gray DNA strands um, indicate the original strand, and blue means it's a new strand. It's the daughter strand. So the three models included conservative replication, semi-conservative conservative replication, and dispersive replication. In conservative replication, what they thought was the two double strands stay together, and there are two new ones synthesized separately. In semi-conservative replication, what people thought was that the two strands come apart and they become templates to form a new daughter strand. And this one becomes the new DNA molecule and a second DNA molecule. So each DNA molecule is half old and half new. Whereas in conservative, you retain the two old strands and you have two new strands to generate the new daughter DNA. In dispersive replication, this last theory, they thought that the parent strands were kind of chopped up or broken up into small pieces and somehow incorporated with the new, uh, newly synthesized strands. So the scientists that discovered which model of replication was correct was actually measles and, and Stahl. So I have my bullet points here. Let me talk about these as I go through the picture with you on the next slide. What measles and Stahl did was they actually worked with E. coli because E. coli are bacteria that grow very rapidly. They divide pretty much every 30 minutes and they grew them first in heavy nitrogen, nitrogen 15, one of the isotopes of nitrogen. And then they grew them in nitrogen 14. And the reason they used nitrogen is because we know that the nucleotides, which make up DNA, are a contain nitrogenous bases. So when you grow E. coli, the heavy nitrogen becomes incorporated into the DNA of these E. coli cells. And if you put the cells into centrifuge tubes containing a cesium chloride solution, these heavy cells, which have incorporated nitrogen 15 into their DNA, will move down the tube, move down the tube to this heavy or denser region. But later they move the cells to a nitrogen 14 solution for growth. And what they saw was that when they centrifuge the cells, the band is higher. So the cells move up the tube. They don't spin down as much. And if they keep doing that after successive cell divisions, then they have more and more of the lighter nitrogen 14 band compared to the heavy band. By performing this experiment, they were able to provide evidence that it was semi-conservative replication that's happening during DNA replication. So if it were not semi-conservative, if it were conservative or dispersive, and you look at the relative amount of, this would be heavy and this would be the lighter nitrogen. Gray would be again heavy and the blue would be the light. If it was any of these scenarios or models, then you would have equal amount of the heavy band and the lighter band on your um, ultra centrifuge tube. But what we actually saw was semi-conservative because you saw greater and greater amounts of the light nitrogen band. And I just took this, let's take this and con continue the replication process. You can see that the more copies you make, the more generations that occur, the more and more blue bands, which represent the light nitrogen, would be formed. And that's why you saw a greater and greater 
um, increase in that nitrogen-14 band in your centrifuge tube. So putting those two pictures together, again, I'm looking at semi-conservative replication, and then I'm kind of continue, continuing the cell division here. And I see as replication continues, there's a greater percentage of the blue band, which is, I'm saying, represents the 14 nitrogen compared to the gray band, which is the original heavy nitrogen, heavy nucleotides. Knowing that DNA replication is semi-conservative, now let's jump into the detailed steps of DNA replication. And we're going to study the process in prokaryotic cells because it's more clear, it's more well studied, and I have some of it shown here. So in prokaryotes, you start replicating your DNA at a region known as the origin of replication, or ORI for short. Here, one of the first enzymes that comes into play is DNA helicase, which separates the two strands of DNA. We call that unzipping. This creates something called a replication fork. This look, looks like a prong of a fork. When you open a bubble, when you open up this part of DNA over here, what happens a lot of the times is the ends get overwhelmed. They're too tight. So we have another enzyme here called topoisomerase to relieve that tightness, that additional coiling that might happen. You also don't want the two strands of DNA to just come back together again. So to prevent that from happening, you have single-stranded binding proteins that bind and stabilize the single strands, prevent them from coming back together. What's really interesting is that, remember I mentioned earlier that you have to add nucleotides to a growing DNA strand at the three prime end, at the three prime end of some nucleotides. But when we're starting DNA replication, there is nothing to add to. There's no three prime end to add to. So one of the first enzymes that come into play, besides the ones I talked about earlier, is primase. And primase is really interesting because the first thing it puts down is actually not DNA, but a small RNA molecule known as the RNA primer. That allows us to have a three prime end to attach additional DNA nucleotides to. All right, so I mentioned all of these are ready. Primase synthesizes the RNA primer. The next enzyme that comes into play is DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is the one that uses the 3' prime end of the primer to, con to continue adding DNA nucleotides to form that daughter strand of DNA. Eventually, you don't want RNA to be in your DNA molecule, so there's another DNA polymerase called DNA polymerase 1 that's going to cut out the RNA primer and replace it with DNA. Finally, in one strand of your growing DNA molecule, you're going to have fragments, discontinuous fragments called Okazaki fragments that will need to be sealed together. And the enzyme that does this is called DNA ligase. So a while ago, I said that two strands of DNA are anti-parallel. One strand runs from five prime to three prime. The other strand I can see is five prime is over here and three prime is over here. So when you're making your daughter strand through that semi-conservative replication, you know that the other strand is going to be anti-parallel. So this is the five prime end and you have the three prime end and you keep growing from there. But I know that I can't grow from three to five. You can only grow from five prime to three prime, adding on to this end. So what we're going to see is down here, we have something called the lagging strand. This is going to be the lagging strand. This is going to be called the leading, leading strand. In the lagging strand, as soon as you open up the DNA using helicase, you'll have a little bit of space to put down a primer, and that will help you generate a five prime end and a three prime end of your primer, and they're going to grow your DNA molecule that way. And as this continues to unzip your double-stranded DNA, you'll eventually have more space to generate another primer, 5 to 3, and you're going to generate another fragment of DNA. These fragments are called Okazaki fragments, 
and they make up your lagging strand. Eventually, they're going to need to be sealed together, and that's conducted or completed through the, those enzymes called DNA ligase enzymes. Here's another look using a different book, but same, same basic enzymes. We have our helicase, our replication fork here, single-stranded binding proteins. This is my leading strand. I can see my primer put down by primase. DNA polymerase 3, this is DNA polymerase 3, is growing that daughter strand from 5 to 3. And then if I look at the lagging strand down here, I can see that I had a primer, then DNA polymerase 3 must have formed this Okazaki fragment, but I have to get rid of that primer. So that's gonna be completed by DNA polymerase 1, removes the primer and replaces that fragment with DNA. And I can see that this is continually forming, you're making DNA using these Okazaki fragments that are going to be sealed using ligase later on. So this is a nice chart from our textbook that summarizes the function of each of those enzymes. And one I just wanted to point out that I did not have earlier is the sliding clamp. That helps to hold DNA polymerase 3, really 3, in place when it's adding nucleotides to uh, build the growing, the new daughter strand of DNA. And finally, remember that all of those enzymes that we were looking at just now are in prokaryotes, which are more well studied in terms of DNA replication. I wanted to look at a few differences in eukaryotes, but we're not going to look at the detailed steps because eukaryotic replication is much more complicated. But there are a few things that we can point out, including the origin of replication. Prokaryotic chromosomes are circular. So when they're replicating their DNA, they only have one origin and they have bidirectional replication. Eukaryotes like us are pretty complicated. We have 46 chromosomes and we have multiple origins of replication because our chromosomes are so big. Unfortunately for us, DNA replication is slower. We wanna make sure there are no errors. In prokaryotes, it's much faster. You can see there are a lot of polymerase types we didn't talk about. In eukaryotes, some cells have telomerase, but prokaryotes don't have that. And then there are different enzymes for these functions. We're gonna focus on the ones in prokaryotes, but know that they exist in eukaryotes, except they're more complex, and many other sub-pathways are involved. And that takes us to the end of part two. In the next video, we're going to look at telomeres, DNA repair mechanisms, and mutations.